Would you pray with me? Indeed, Lord, knowing you is the greatest thing. With you, knowing you, we can withstand anything that comes upon us in this world, knowing that we will be with you forever. Lord, we are here to sit under your word. Speak to us, O Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. May what I say that is consistent with your word be remembered, loved, and lived. Lord, if there is anything that I say that is not true to your word, may it be quickly forgotten. But speak to us, Holy Spirit, illumine our minds and increase our love for you. Amen. Well, there are a lot of words we could use to describe the times in which we live, and one of them, without a doubt, is unsettling. From the moment of the fall in Genesis 3, there have always been people around the world who have been characterized by that word. They've been unsettled. But it seems that now really everyone in the world, just about everyone, has experienced the unsettling nature of this crisis. Relatively few people are untouched, unaffected, undisturbed. These are disturbing times, and disturbing times are revealing times. Jesus reminds us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 that the storms of life reveal the foundation of one's life. Those who are foolish enough to build their house on sand find that their life is falling apart when the storms come. But those who are wise and build their life on the rock of Christ and His teaching, though they might be locked in their house, They are warm and well. Using a similar analogy in Ephesians 4, Paul says those who are immature and naive are blown here and there and everywhere by the wind and the waves of doctrine and philosophy and false thinking. But those who know the truth are able to stand firm against anything that would seek to shake them from their solid ground. Like most storms, the winds of our time are not just blowing one direction. We're being hit from various directions and the wind keeps changing. Is it possible to stand firm in such times? Is it even possible that someone might flourish in difficulty like this when they are unsettled? Well, not only is it possible to stand firm and not only is it conceivable that someone might flourish, we are actually promised that we would do those things if we would ground our lives on the right foundation. And we find that ground set before us in our text for today, which is Psalm 1. So if you haven't already, I would invite you to open your Bible to Psalm 1. There's a lot of mystery behind the organization of the 150 psalms. But what is clear is that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are intentionally placed at the beginning as a kind of introduction or you might say a preface to the rest of the psalms. Often in a preface, an author will speak to various audiences and set up their expectations of what they're going to find in that book. And that's exactly what we have here In Psalm 1, it is a word to the wise of what happens when you heed the words of this book and a warning to the wicked of what happens when you reject the words of this book. Let's read Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous." 
For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The first word of this psalm is blessed. The NAS has how blessed, but really it's just blessed. And the concept of blessing is a major theme in the Old Testament. In fact, after Israel had received the law for the second time in Deuteronomy chapter 28, they are provided all of the blessings that will come upon those who obey God's law and all of the curses that will come upon those who disobey God's law. The concept of blessings in that sense has to do with tangible benefits of having God's favor. They refer to God's protection, His provision, and His kind providence in their lives. The Old Testament saints knew God was blessing them because generally life was going really well. Just think of Job. Since you're there at Psalm 1, just look at the previous page at Job 42, verse 12. It says, The Lord blessed the latter days of Job, more than his beginning. And then it goes on to say that Job had more livestock, more children, more land, and more possessions than ever before. There are exceptions to this principle, but generally speaking, the blessing of God meant a physically and financially prosperous life. When we come to Psalm 1, we're not talking about that kind of blessing. Material prosperity is not the promise of this psalm. In fact, the Hebrew word for blessing, it's a different word than what we find in Job 42.12 and most of the Old Testament. It's a different type of blessing. This blessing is not outward tangible benefits a person receives when they have God's approval. It rather has to do with an inward condition of the heart. The other type of blessing has to do with what others see when you are blessed. This type of blessing has to do with what you feel when you are blessed. Specifically, this blessing means to be happy, joyful, satisfied, content. It is an inward state of peace and happiness that can exist in times of prosperity and in times of poverty. It's a joy that transcends circumstances. One of the few times this word is used outside of the Psalms and Proverbs is in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. The Queen of Sheba visits Solomon, and not only does she hear uh, his wisdom for herself, but she sees the effects of his wisdom on the kingdom of Israel. Her response is to say, How blessed are your men! How blessed are your servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom. Some translations reflect the meaning and they say, how happy are they? For everyone in Solomon's court, from the lowest servant to the highest official, it was a happy time. They were, their hearts were filled with joy because of the opportunity they had to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. On the other hand, a person can be blessed or happy or joyful in very difficult circumstances. Psalm 146 verse 5 says, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. And then it goes on to praise the Lord for how he watches over the oppressed, the hungry, the widow, the fatherless, and the sojourner. The blessed life of Psalm 1 is one where you experience happiness, joy, contentment, and peace in your life. Regardless of the circumstances of your life, your marital status, your employment status, your financial status, your family relationships, your health, your troubled past, or your uncertain future, Psalm 1 teaches us today how to be happy joyful, content. Indeed, it teaches us how to flourish in a time of crisis. This is a message each one of us needs to hear. We are beings of perception, which means that we naturally live and think and feel based on the input of the five senses. And as we age and mature, our perception increases And we come to agree with Eliphaz, who said, Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. And then Job later affirmed that statement by saying, Man who is born of woman 
is few of days and full of trouble. We understand this. It doesn't matter the relative ease or the relative difficulty of your life. The reality is we live under the curse of sin and that curse affects everything around us and everything in us. Suffering, not unbridled happiness, is a tie that binds humanity. And were it not for God's grace, life would be misery. The only way to flourish, that is to live a life that surpasses our perception, is to have our vision expanded by one who can see beyond what we can see, one whose knowledge of reality transcends our perception. And this is the role of Scripture in our lives. All of Scripture, but the Psalms in particular, shows us how understanding God's perception of reality transforms a person's experience of and response to the joys and sorrows of life. Now, with all of that in mind, we're going to look at Psalm 1 under three headings. The first heading is the source of the blessed life. The second heading, the strength of the blessed life. And the third heading, the sequel of the blessed life. Let's begin with the source of the blessed life. Look again at verses 1 and 2. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. We have set before us here two competing sources of life. These these are not the origin of life. These are the foundations upon which one builds your life. These are the two sources where you can go to, to to, to learn how to think and how to live. And whatever source you choose will determine where and with whom you will walk and stand and sit. That is, who become your influential companions. The book of Psalms divides humanity into two groups. The righteous and the wicked. The the righteous are those who know and love the Lord and who follow Him, and thus they embrace the Lord's view of reality and life. And the wicked are those who do not know and follow the Lord, and they do not embrace His view of life, and so they come up with competing explanations and understandings of life and reality. So the wicked are not those who are on some dark, extreme side of the spectrum of evil. Nor are the righteous those who are on the brightest side of some spectrum of goodness. If you belong to the Lord, you are the righteous. And if you do not belong to the Lord, you are the wicked. You are either one or the other. And I pray that if you are not already a part of the assembly of the righteous, that today you will turn from your wickedness And submit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and that you will become part of the righteous. Everyone who is righteous begins this life in the assembly of the wicked. And it is only by God's grace and salvation that anyone is transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the challenge we all face as we come into this new life, joined to a new family, following a new master, is the challenge of learning to live life in a completely different way than what we've known. And so it is a common theme in Scripture that the people of God are called to be transformed in the way they think about everything and learn to adopt God's view of life. The temptation every single one of us face is that we allow our old life, our old friends, the old ways of thinking to continue to counsel us. To give counsel means to speak into a situation based on one's view of life. We might call that one's worldview. And counseling doesn't happen just in a private room or office. In fact, most of the counseling we experience happens without us even realizing it. If you're listening to me right now, 
you are being counseled. When you read or watch the news, you are being counseled. When you read articles and blog posts, you're being counseled. When you read memes on social media, you are being counseled. When you watch commercials, TV shows, movies, and documentaries, you are being counseled. When you listen to press conferences and political speeches, you're being counseled. When you're taking a class, listening to lectures, reading books, you are being counseled. When you're in a conversation with someone, often you are being counseled. We are being counseled all the time. And everyone who counsels us does so from their view of God and life. They are applying their worldview to the topic at hand. And unless it offends your current worldview, what you hear or what you read can become part of your own pattern of thinking. And this can happen in the most subtle of ways. And because they are so subtle, I think it's worth taking time to consider four ways that we might be tempted to walk in the counsel of the wicked. And this is by no means exhaustive. These are just four ways that maybe we've experienced in our own lives and in this modern age. The first subtle way we might be walking in the counsel of the wicked is by holding fast to concepts and ideas that are passed down from generation to generation to the degree that they've become ingrained in our identity. These might be ideas related to family of origin or political associations or ethnic or cultural background. And when a person becomes a Christian, when they start a new life, they don't always realize the extent to which their old ways of thinking are an affront to God. Beloved, if what we've learned from our parents or our grandparents goes against what God's word says, we need to learn to set that counsel aside. For example, one piece of counsel that is often passed down from one generation to another is the idea that the shade of one's skin or the geographical origin of one's ancestors makes us different kinds of human beings, different races. But this is an offense to God, who made it abundantly clear that there is only one race, the human race, all of whom are made in the image of God. And so any animus from one ethnicity to another is actually an attack on God himself. The subtlety of inherited counsel can be so ingrained that even those who agree with their lips with what God says can sometimes harbor in their own heart the old ideas and prejudice. As the people of God, we must start a new inheritance of counsel that we will pass down to our children. A second way that we might subtly walk in the counsel of the wicked is when we lack the knowledge of the truth that would otherwise cause us to filter out the things that we hear. And so lacking that filter, we adopt the wicked's way of thinking about life, not realizing that Jesus would have us think completely differently. For example, when the world experiences a tragedy, be it a natural disaster, a worldwide pandemic, or an unjust death, it wants answers. It wants justice. It wants someone to blame. If not for the tragedy itself, then for the response to the tragedy. People often want to hold leaders accountable, not for objective failures, but for not governing in the way that they would prefer. But when Jesus was told about the unjust and sacrilegious murder of a group of Galileans, he said in Luke 13, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but... Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus didn't make calls for justice. He didn't start a petition. He didn't hold a protest to raise awareness of the very real and systemic injustices of that time. No, he used a tragedy as an opportunity to call people to repentance because death comes to us all. 
At the end of Matthew 23, Jesus addressed people who were under the authority of the hypocritical Jewish leaders. And instead of telling them to hold their leaders accountable, Jesus told them to honor and respect those hypocritical authorities and to submit to them and not follow their example. Well, a third way that we might be tempted to walk in the counsel of the wicked is by imitating their impulse to take a stand and make a judgment about every situation or circumstance that comes to our attention. The wicked believe it is their right to know, indeed their duty to find out all the details of what goes on in the courtroom or the Oval Office or the halls of Congress or for investigators and scientists to keep the public fully aware of all their findings. We live in a society of busybodies where we, the culture, not only have the right to know, but indeed we have the duty to be vocal expert witnesses in the court of public opinion. We've arrived at a point in society where for the price of an internet connection were conveyed degrees in law, science, journalism, criminal justice, and political science. But we are like those in 1 Timothy 1.7 whom Paul describes saying, For some men have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. And what is so grievous to the Lord is that despite the eternal realities that bind believers together, we imitate the world by making enemies of brothers and sisters in Christ who come to different conclusions than we do. And we also make enemies of those who are our mission field. Brothers and sisters, if we delight in the law of the Lord, it would do us well to meditate on these words given to us by the Holy Spirit in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business, and work with your hands just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Or ponder 1 Peter 2, 18, where after telling Christians to submit to an evil and corrupt government, Peter writes, Slaves, be submissive to your own masters with all respect. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are, and then he uses a word that means corrupt, dishonest, unscrupulous. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Beloved, God's word does not call us to ignore suffering, pain, and justice. Instead, our Lord calls us to respond to these difficulties in such a way that when the world sees us, they squint their eyes and scratch their heads and ask, why are you responding that way? Why are you saying things like that? Why do you have so much hope? Finally, a fourth way we might subtly walk in the counsel of the wicked is by allowing the world, and especially in our day, the media, to tell us what we should care about or what is important. What is important to the wicked? What occupies their conversation? What raises their emotional fervor? What calls them to action is whatever is in the headlines or whatever is trending on social media. Now, obviously, there's things that are Worthy. There's matters that are worthy of local, national, and even global attention. And every culture has always had a way of distributing critical information to the masses. But in our world, there is a near complete loss of what is relevant for our daily lives. The irrelevant crowds out the relevant. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Colossians 3 2 says, Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. Or Philippians 4.8, finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. 
Jesus, quoting Moses, said in Matthew 3, 4, Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We could pile on passage after passage that tells us that what is most important, what is most relevant for our lives is the word of God. So when we allow our thinking and our conversations and our priorities to be controlled by the world, we crowd the word of God out of our minds. Now, someone might say, but I can do both. I I can stay up on the news and I can be in the word. And definitely that is true. But before we get too comfortable, it may be a helpful exercise to consider how much time we spend doing one versus the other. Or perhaps we can count our social media posts and see what are the types of things and how often do we post about them. Or another test is to Examine our emotions, our anxieties, our fears, our joys, and ask ourselves, what is driving our emotions throughout the day? If we honestly examine ourselves by those kinds of means, we might find we're not as balanced as we thought we were. Now, each of us must examine our own hearts and lives, and we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and no one else. But do you find yourself being enticed by the ways of the world, imitating the way the world thinks and acts? Do you sense that the way you think and respond to the challenges of our day are similar to the wicked? I would appeal to you to turn to the source of the blessed life. Verse 2 describes that source. Look at it again. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. The blessed man meditates and delights in the law of the Lord. Law here is the word for Torah. It's that portion of scripture which defined the boundaries and paved the course for God's people. Without the law, the people of God, Israel, were lost. Their identity and very life was bound up In the law of God. To not have the law of God by sheer ignorance or even worse, rebellion, was to lose every defining characteristic of being the people of God. And that's what we see in Israel's history. But with the Torah, Israel had life, they had meaning and purpose. They understood reality from the origin of the universe to their purpose in glorifying God by being a light to the nations. They could do their work and manage their households and worship God and enjoy relationships and handle adversity with confidence in the Lord. Is that not what the Word of God, both Old and New Testaments, does for us today? It informs us of physical and spiritual realities from God's perspective so that we're not blindsided at every turn. We understand the the nature of man. We have God revealed to us in all of his glorious character. And we know where history is leading. Now, we don't know what will happen tomorrow or next month or next year, but we know that God is in control of all things. And we can trust him knowing that all that he does is for our good and his glory. God's word reveals to us what God has done to rescue us from destruction And goes further to show us and teach us how to live a life reflecting God's glory. I remember sitting in my 10th grade English class. I'm sure my teacher would be horrified that this is the only thing I remember about that class. But he was explaining an assignment to summarize a book in 12 words or less. And then he gave an example. He says, I can summarize the Bible in five words or less. And then he turned around on the board and wrote, God creates man, makes rules. Wrong. That is the view of a scoffer. Yes, the Bible has rules, but more than that, it contains the meaning and mystery of life. It reveals God to us. Listen carefully to this quote by John Piper. I love the Bible the way I love my eyes. 
Not because my eyes are lovely, but because without them, I can't see what's lovely. Without the Bible, I could not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Without the Bible, I could not know the unsearchable riches of Christ. Without the Bible, I would not know that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. I love the Bible because it gives me the wisdom that leads to salvation and shows me that this salvation is nothing less than seeing and savoring the glory of Christ forever. And then provides me inexhaustible ways of seeing and knowing and enjoying Christ, end quote. God's word is something to be delighted in, something to be loved and treasured. Do you delight in the law of the Lord? Psalm 119 is an extended exaltation over the word of God. And in that psalm, delight is expressed nine times. Consider these nine indicators of delight in God's word. Verse 16 of Psalm 119. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. When you delight in the word of God, you don't allow it to collect dust in your mind. Verse 24. Your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. When you delight in the law of the Lord, you go to it for counsel, for encouragement and comfort and wisdom and instruction. Verse 35, make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. When you delight in God's word, you want nothing more than to live consistently with it. Verse 47, I shall delight in your commandments, which I love. When you delight in the law of the Lord, you are not passive, but intentional and purposeful in delighting in it. Verse 70, their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. A fat covered heart is a heart that is self-focused. It cares nothing about others or God. When you delight in the law of the Lord, your heart is lean because the word of God produces in you right attitudes and actions. Verse 77, may your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. When you delight in the law of the Lord, it's where you turn to hear God's compassion and comfort. Verse 92, if your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. When you delight in the law of God, it sustains you even through Impossibly deep and painful suffering. Verse 143, trouble and anguish have come upon me, yet your commandments are my delight. When you delight in the law of the Lord, not even great difficulty can remove that delight from you. Verse 174, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. When you delight in the law of the Lord, it produces in you deep desires and longings that are oriented around the Lord. Well, because the psalmist delights so much in the law of the Lord, he says in verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And then in verse 148, My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. That is what the blessed man does. His delight leads to constant meditation on God's word. Thinking about it, praying it, singing it, hearing it, praising the Lord for it, talking to others about it, studying it, memorizing it, applying it. I ask again, do you delight in God's word? Does the law of the Lord have a prominent place in your home? The word of Christ is a balm for the soul in times of sorrow. It is wisdom for the naive, warning for the rebellious, water for the thirsty, food for the hungry, guidance for the confused, hope for the lost, strength for the weary, joy for the downcast. It provides for us everything that we need for life and godliness. And it is those things, 
Because its primary message is the glory of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us so that we might have life, eternal life, which is a quality of life that transcends the here and now. The blessed life is not the trouble-free life. It is the life lived with a mind fixed on seeing reality through the eyes of him who created us and knows us and loves us. Delighting in the law of the Lord is the source of the blessed life. Let's turn now to consider the second heading, the strength of the blessed life. And these last two will go by a little faster. As we move to verses 3 and 4, we have here a vivid picture of the blessed life contrasted with the life of the wicked. Look at it. It says, He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The image here speaks to the rescue, productiveness, and the fortitude of the righteous. It says he is like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. The word planted actually has the idea of being transplanted. This tree was removed from a dry and weary land and planted in a lush and irrigated land. We who delight in God like this tree have been rescued from death. When God saves us, he transfers us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. This transplanted tree continually yields its fruit in its season. That is to say, it's alive and healthy. It produces according to its design. Spurgeon said, The man who delights in God's word, being taught by it, brings forth patience in the time of suffering, faith in the day of trial, and holy joy in the hour of prosperity. Fruitfulness, he says, is an essential quality of a gracious man, and that fruitfulness should be seasonable, unquote. The leaves on this tree don't wither. This tree is protected by disease and insects and termites and anything that would destroy it from within. And it's protected from lightning and storms and hurricanes that would topple it. This tree has fortitude. It weathers every storm and outlasts every season. And so it is with a blessed man and woman. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. The one who delights in the law of the Lord endures through droughts and storms. In summary, the psalmist here writes, In whatever he does, he prospers. Now, before we start thinking about our bank accounts, consider that no tree has the prosperity for itself. Its productivity and prosperity benefit the owner and the passers-by. In the same way, the prosperity of our lives, the fruit that we bear, is not ultimately for us, but for God and His glory as we take the fruit that He produces in us and we use it to bless others. The fruit of a righteous life is clearly defined in the New Testament, Galatians 5, in terms of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The blessed person is not necessarily the one who prospers materially. The blessed person is the one who is characterized, according to Colossians 1, by growth in spiritual knowledge and wisdom, pleasing God in all respects, bearing good fruit in every good work, steadfast and strengthened in the Lord. The righteous person, the blessed man, the happy person is, has enduring strength and is a productive tree in the field of God. And this picture of strength and vitality, as you see, is set against the most extreme comparison possible. Look again at verse 4. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Picture in your mind that strong and fruit-filled tree on a hill. 
and next to that tree put a small outbuilding with open walls that is used for threshing wheat. Farmers would bring in the wheat and they would grind it up to loosen the husks and then they would use a pitchfork to toss the wheat into the air. And and the grains of wheat which were heavier would fall to the ground, but the husks, the chaff, would get blown by the breeze away. It's hard to imagine a greater contrast than a, a tree full of life and fruit, and strength compared to that useless chaff that's blown by the afternoon breeze. The wicked are not alive. They are spiritually dead. They are not anchored by truth. They are blown helplessly around by the wind. The wicked do not bear fruit. They produce nothing of lasting value. The wicked do not prosper. Their end is always and only destruction. That is the contrast between the righteous and the wicked from God's perspective. Now, if we relied on what our eyes see, we would have a hard time coming up with this truth, wouldn't we? Because it so often seems that the wicked enjoy prosperity in this life. Whether it's put those in positions of power or those who have great influ- influence through government and media, entertainment, or even people at work. It often seems like those who make it to the top are those who compromise value and twist the truth and cut corners. But again, this is not about prosperity in terms of financial success or lifestyle or achievement. This is about one's spiritual condition and experience of of real and eternal life. Therefore, it shouldn't surprise us that people who we might deem as successful sometimes take their own life. Because they're lost and miserable and hopeless. It shouldn't surprise us that they have trouble sustaining relationships and that substance abuse is pervasive among the rich and famous because they do not have life. The issue is not how much or how little you have, it's whether you have a soul-satisfying relationship with God. And without that, people will fill the void with anything that they think will make them happy. Apart from God, there's no strength, no life, no fruitfulness, no true happiness, no joy or satisfaction. But if we delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it, you will experience a strong and fruitful life, even in a crisis. And finally, let's consider the sequel of the blessed life. What happens after death? Verses 5 to 6 describe really the result of the wicked life, but embedded in there is the sequel of the blessed life. Look at verse 5. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. These two lines are parallel statements where the second repeats and expands upon the first. The judgment spoken of is probably not the final judgment where clearly the wicked have no stand in, in Christ's court. In fact, the phrase, the judgment, is not a technical phrase that Jews would have understood to mean what we know from the New Testament as the great white throne judgment. Rather, they understood God's judgment as being an ongoing reality. The Lord executes judgment on His own timetable, both in this life and in the next. The prophets predicted judgment on the nations, and that was executed over time as God's plan unfolded. At times, the Lord judged on the spot, as He did with Nadab and Abihu. Other times, His judgment came generations later. But as Hebrews says, it is appointed for man once to die and then face judgment. In other words, for the wicked, judgment always comes. The point here in Psalm 1 is that whenever God opens the case file of the wicked... It results in condemnation and eternal isolation from the people of God. The assembly of the righteous, as it says, is where the presence of the Lord dwells. It's where life-giving truth is celebrated and sung and proclaimed. The word of the Lord endures forever. And so in this life and in the next, the assembly of the righteous delight in the law of the Lord and the wicked will not be there. And so we come to verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. 
the word for tells us that verse 6 explains verse 5. Verse 6 answers the question, why will sinners not stand in the assembly of the righteous? And the answer is, because the Lord knows the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked will perish. Well, how does the Lord knowing the way of the righteous lead to the wicked exclusion, being excluded from the people of God? Well, we can allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. You can turn back to Psalm 34, and I'll just read Psalm 34, verses 15 to 22. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of him, him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none who, of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. When Psalm 1 says that the Lord knows the way of the righteous, it means he has his eye on you. It means his ear is attentive to your prayer. It means the Lord hears and delivers you in times of trouble. It means he draws near to you when you are broken and delivers you when you are crushed and afflicted. If you take refuge in him, he will deliver you in the end and give you everlasting life. But if you choose the way of the wicked and sin and scoffing, The Lord is against you. In your affliction, he doesn't hear your prayer. When the Lord turns his attention toward you, it is to bring condemnation. So why will the wicked not stand in the assembly of the righteous? Because the Lord will not allow sinners to forever oppress those who belong to him. No sinner will escape the judgment of God and no righteous person will be forgotten by the Lord. Well, as we close, we have to answer the question that should be on the minds of anyone who is less than convinced that they are part of the assembly of the righteous. Friend, if you know that you are among the wicked, you know that you have not believed in and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and bowed the knee to him, or maybe you thought you had, but Hearing this message, you realize you don't at all delight in the law of the Lord. I have good news for you. The Lord himself offers a way for us to to move from the assembly of the wicked to the assembly of the righteous and to escape the wrath of God that comes upon the wicked. You have to start by acknowledging that God is creator and that as the one who made us, he has the right and authority to rule over us And you need to confess and agree with him that you have violated his law and are justly due the condemnation that is coming upon you. But then you must delight in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that though he is and was God, he came to this earth as a man. He he lived a perfect life and he died a death paying the the penalty for sinners. And on the third day, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And he doesn't just want you to believe in him. He wants you to bow the knee and submit to him as a gracious Lord and master. You must die to the life that you've lived up to this point and start a new life based on a new source, the word of God. When you confess your sin and bow the knee to Christ, he will forgive you. And not only does he forgive you, but he counts you among the righteous. He takes you from the wicked and puts you into the assembly of the righteous and he gives you a new title, righteous. A new family, he makes you his child and a new destiny welcomes you into eternity. So if you have not 
Bow the knee to Christ. Confess your sin today and trust in Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. Well, how can we flourish in a crisis? By delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on his law day and night and letting it govern our thoughts, our emotions, our priorities, our attitudes, and our actions. Let us pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, what would we do apart from you? Indeed, we would be still in the assembly of the wicked. We would be lost in our sin. We would be headed for condemnation. But praise be to you that you have given us your Son, who has freed us by his work on the cross and his resurrection from the power and the penalty of sin. And you've given us your Spirit to give us new life and give us an illumination into your word that we might know and understand and believe. And you've empowered us by your spirit to live that righteous life, delighting in your word. You've given us your instructions. You've given us this revelation of you and your view of reality. God, may we be a people who delight in you. May we not allow ourselves to be controlled by the world, to be influenced away from you. But may our greatest desire is to know you in increasing and manifold ways. For your glory's sake we pray. Amen.